Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Q2 2020, the Cooper Company's Inc. Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today. Kim Duncan, Vice President, Investor Relations and Risk Management. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon. And welcome to the Cooper Company's second quarter 2020 earnings conference call. During today's call, we will discuss the results included in the earnings release and then use the remaining time for Q&A. Our presenters on today's call are Al White, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Brian Andrews, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this conference call contains forward-looking statements, including all guidance and other statements regarding anticipated results of operations, market or regulatory conditions, and integration of any acquisitions, or their failure to achieve anticipated benefits. Forward-looking statements depend on assumptions, data, or methods that may be incorrect or imprecise and are subject to risks and uncertainties. Events that could cause our actual results and future actions of the company to differ materially from those described in forward-looking statements are set forth under the caption, forward-looking statements, in today's earnings release and are described in our SEC filings, including Cooper's Form 10-K and subsequent Form 10-Q filings, all of which are available on our website at coopercodes.com. This conference call also contains non-GAAP financial measures. Please refer to today's earnings release for a reconciliation of those measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. Should you have any additional questions following the call, please call our investor line at 925-460-3663 or email ir at cooperco.com. And now I'll turn the call over to Al for his opening remarks. Thank you, Ken, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you and your families are healthy and staying safe during these challenging times. Before getting into our results, I want to recognize and say thank you to our employees whose hard work dedication, and resiliency have allowed us to continue moving forward through the global COVID-19 pandemic. We're coming out of this a stronger company, so amazing job to all Cooper employees around the world, and again, thank you. From the outset, we made the health and well-being of our 12,000-plus employees and their families a top priority. We instituted robust health and safety programs at all of our facilities, including staggering shifts, reorganizing workflows, and implementing work-from-home protocols to ensure social distancing. In the spirit of our strong company culture and our commitment to our people, we continue paying employees their normal compensation, including supporting our commission sales reps. Avoided layoffs, furloughed employees only upon request, maintained all benefits programs, and expanded our employee assistance programs. We've also been there supporting customers by offering new and innovative online training and virtual meetings, expanding our world-class customer service efforts, accelerating our direct-to-patient shipping activity, and providing extended terms to our small business partners. Throughout everything that's happened, we stayed focused on our long-term business objectives, and we believe this will serve us well moving forward. This includes developing and launching new products, increasing manufacturing output of high-demand products such as MyDay, enhancing distribution capabilities, and expanding facilities in key strategic locations such as Costa Rica. Looking ahead, our performance will be driven by the reopening of optometry offices for Cooper Vision and the reopening of OBGYN offices and fertility clinics for Cooper Surgical. We cannot control the speed of the reopenings, but we can be ready, and we are. It's very difficult to forecast the future, but we're definitely seeing positive signs with trends moving in our favor. As we move into the numbers, note I'll be reporting percentages on a constant currency basis. For Q2, we reported consolidated revenues of $525 million, with CooperVision posting revenues of $402 million, down 15%, and Cooper Surgical posting revenues of $123 million, down 27%. Non-GAAP earnings per share were $1.51. For Cooper Vision, regional revenue declined around the world with the Americas down 22%, EMEA 11%, and Asia PAC 10%. All product areas were also negatively impacted, with silicone hydrogel dailies down 8%, Biofinity and Avera 16%, Torx 13%, and Multifocal 7%. I'll get to the fiscal quarter in a minute, 
But for calendar Q1, we grew 2.5%, continuing to take share against the market, which grew roughly 1%. This improved our global market share to a very strong 24%, and I'm optimistic we'll move to 25% during the year. Calendar Q1 included March when the industry began experiencing the negative impacts of COVID-19, but our numbers held up better than others due to market share gains from our daily silicone hydrogel portfolio. Regarding our fiscal quarter, the negative impact of economies closing around the world was felt throughout the quarter, but was most significant in April, with sales down roughly 45% for the month. To provide color on the quarter, let me highlight the dollar impact and where we saw it. At one point during the quarter, I had us tagged at $510 million in fiscal, two revenues, fiscal Q2 revenues, and we ultimately reported roughly $110 million worse than that. Three primary areas impacted us. First was the effect of office closures on new fits. In a normal environment, new fits, including trade-ups, account for roughly 15% of our revenues, and these essentially disappeared. We estimate this negatively impacted us around $40 million for the quarter. Second, we experienced a reduction in channel inventory as retailers, distributors, and independent optometrists closed stores and offices and focused on liquidity. This was modestly offset by sales to pure Internet sellers, but that's not a big part of our business. We estimate the negative impact of this activity was around $35 million. Lastly, we saw a reduction in consumer consumption, meaning people use their lenses less, less often as they extended the wear of their products or chose to wear glasses more often. This meant customers who would normally have ordered lenses in late March and April either didn't reorder or ordered smaller quantities than normal and this made up the remaining roughly 35%. We certainly expect to recoup some of these lost sales, but it's difficult to forecast when. Our market research clearly indicates consumers expect to return to normal wearing habits as economies reopen, so we're optimistic. We did see an improvement in May, but revenues were still down roughly 30%. On the encouraging side, there were clear positive signs as the month progressed, and that's continued into June. As a matter of fact, in parts of the world where economies started reopening sooner, we've seen a pretty quick rebound with countries like China showing growth in May. For Q3, it's difficult to forecast revenues as the three items I just mentioned will have a major impact on our results, but we're currently expecting fiscal Q3 sales for Cooper Vision to be down 15 to 20 percent year over year. This assumes a minimal rebound in channel inventory and a slow return in patient traffic as ECT slowly reopens stores. Hopefully this is conservative, but it's prudent to be conservative right now, even with the positive trends we're seeing. Regarding products, I'm happy to report we recently launched two new ones. Our Biofinity Tort Multifocal is now available in the U.S. and rolling out around the rest of the world and our extended torque range for clarity has been released, giving it the widest parameter range available in the market today for daily silicone torques. I'm also happy to report we made significant progress on my day manufacturing, and we're now able to supply product to markets where we previously pulled it. We're also starting to resume placing steer and torque fitting sets as stores reopen around the world. As we discussed on our last earnings call, we realigned significant resources earlier this year to accelerate startup efforts on new My Day lines, and this activity continued essentially unhampered through Q2. We're now several months ahead of, of our prior plans, so a fantastic job to the manufacturing teams and our distribution and commercial teams moving quickly to put us in a position to capitalize on this opportunity. We saw similar improvements in our clarity manufacturing, so we're in great shape in the daily silicone and hydrogel market especially with respect to toric lenses. And this is critical as our survey data indicates usage and purchase frequency reductions are expected to be temporary, with practitioners aggressively fitting patients into daily silicones as offices reopen. Moving to my site, this was a bright spot for the quarter, growing 52% to $1.4 million in revenue. And I'm happy to report we've seen a significant increase in interest from optometrists as they look for value-added ways to increase patient flow as their practices reopen. My site is a perfect fit as optometrists truly want to treat their patients with the best products available, and this is the only FDA-approved myopia management offering on the market. Additionally, parent interest is very high when they're made aware of my site. 
The product can make a huge difference in a child's life, and the doctors control the process and pricing as the product is not available online. As a reminder, my site is our innovative FDA-approved myopia management contact lens that has been clinically proven to slow the progression of myopia in children. The lens is sold as part of a holistic myopia management program called Brilliant Futures, where we provide the eye care practitioner the lens and a suite of resources to help them connect with parents and to market the product. The doctor then incorporates this into their own customized myopia management program and charges an appropriate price for their offering. From a training and certification perspective, we pivoted to virtual training, and the response has been fantastic. In the U.S., we now have over 200 certified fitters with over 600 additional optometrists currently in the certification process. This puts us ahead of our previous expectations. Success is clearly dependent on offices reopening, but we expect solid growth with full fiscal year sales being in the 7 to $8 million range. And assuming markets return to normal, we remain comfortable with our target of $25 million in sales next year. And to be clear, we have not curtailed any investments in this product other than deferring certain marketing costs due to recent events. And frankly, if all continues to go as well as it has been, we may actually accelerate investments in Q4. Before concluding on vision, let me touch on the growth drivers for the $9 billion contact lens industry. First and foremost, it starts with myopia, where it's estimated that roughly one-third of the world's population is myopic, and this is expected to increase to 50% by 2050. We've been seeing this play out in the market data with new wearers up 2% globally last year. Additionally, we continue to see positive sales mix as doctors are fitting new patients in daily silicone hydrogel lenses, and then we have the trade-up from legacy hydrogel dailies and FRPs to silicone hydrogel dailies, geographic expansion, and growth in torques and multifocals. It's also interesting working with optometrists as the shift to daily lenses has made it more apparent that contact lens wearers are higher value customers as they buy both contact lenses and glasses. Moving to Cooper Surgical, we reported revenues of $123 million, down 27% for the quarter. We were feeling very bullish about our business in March, but as elective surgery restrictions were enacted and OBGYN offices and fertility clinics started closing, we began experiencing a significant decline in revenue. In the month of April alone, we were down almost 70%. May was still down roughly 60% as the beginning of the month was extremely weak, but we definitely saw improvement as the month progressed, and we expect continued improvement through the quarter. For the full fiscal Q3, we forecast Cooper Surgical's revenues being down 30 to 35%. Within the segments, fertility was down 15% for the quarter, holding up reasonably well as in-process patients were largely allowed to complete their treatments. Having said that, April was down roughly 50% as clinics around the world closed, and May was also down roughly 50% as several markets remained partially or entirely closed. Clinics are now reopening and patient traffic is good, but it's important to note that our sales will lag initial patient activity as those visits are focused on consultations and the stimulation or pharma side of IVF. We thus expect our business to continue rebounding, but for the full Q3, we expect fertility sales to decline around 30%. For office and surgical, sales were down 34% in Q2, and we expect a similar decline in Q3. This is largely due to Paragard, where we essentially shipped zero product in the months of April and May. To be clear, this is a channel inventory matter as placements for Paragard continued in those months, although down roughly 65% in April and 40% in May. Our consumer research indicates we'll see placements fully return to normal as offices reopen, and we saw positive signs through May. So we expect a strong rebound in sales as offices reopen and as channel inventory returns to normal. Outside of Paragard, our other office and surgical products were down roughly 20% in Q2, and we expect a similar result in Q3, with our research showing the majority of procedures were deferred, not canceled, and the procedures will happen as doctors' offices reopen. Within all this, Cooper Surgical continue making product in many other areas of the business, including continuing the build-out and transferring of IVF production into our global manufacturing facility in Costa Rica, completing numerous sales and marketing virtual training sessions, which have been incredibly popular, 
and making meaningful advancements with product development and R&D. And importantly, our manufacturing and distribution teams kept our products available and shipping while several competitors struggled, now providing us the opportunity for future share gains. With that, let me conclude by saying our teams are laser-focused on executing as economies around the world open. Our commercial teams are intensely focused on capitalizing on opportunities, and momentum is building. Key products like MyDay are in a much better shape, and our product launches such as MySite are going well. Cooper's culture remains rock solid, with our commitment to our employees remaining steadfast, our dedication to our ESG efforts continuing, and our focus on our long-term strategic objectives remaining intact. And I'm 100% confident our employees are fully engaged and ready to deliver results. With that, I'll turn the call over to Brian. Thank you, Al, and good afternoon, everyone. Most of my commentary will be on a non-GAAP basis, so please refer to today's earnings release for a full reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP results. Given the challenges that COVID-19 has brought upon our operations and the uncertainty regarding the future impact, we will not be issuing 2020 guidance at this time. But I'll try to provide as much transparency and disclosure as possible in my comments. To start, it's important to mention that our non-GAAP earnings are adjusted for the larger COVID-19 related items within cost of goods, but we did not try to capture all costs, nor did we adjust any of our operating expenses for these items. Moving to our results, our second quarter consolidated revenue decreased 19.8% year over year to $524.9 million. Consolidated gross margin for the quarter decreased year over year to 65.8% from 67.3%. This was driven entirely by April as margins were up nicely through the first two months of the quarter. Cooper Vision's gross margin decreased slightly to 66% from 66.5%, driven by a shift in our regional sales mix as we experienced larger percentage declines in revenues in markets with higher margins. Cooper Surgical's gross margin decreased to 65.4% from 69.6%, largely due to Paragard sales being zero in April. OPEX was down 3.2% year over year, resulting in consolidated operating margins of 17.4%, down from 27.1% last year. Despite the top-line pressures, we continued investing in our business, which meant no material changes to employee compensation, continued support of our key products such as MySite, and continued R&D investing while incurring higher costs related to COVID-19. Interest expense for the quarter reduced to $8.8 million, driven by lower interest rates. The effective tax rate was 6.2% due to the overall reduction of pre-tax income and the benefit of stock options exercised in the quarter. Non-GAAP ETS was $1.51, with roughly 49.6 million average shares outstanding. Free cash flow was negative $63.5 million, and was comprised of $25.8 million of operating cash flow, offset by $89.3 million of CapEx. This reduction was primarily due to lower customer collections, a buildup of inventory, and maintaining CapEx as planned. Net debt increased by $118.6 million to $1.8 billion, and our adjusted leverage ratio was 2.18 times. A few other items to note on Q2. We repurchased roughly 161,000 shares for $47.8 million. We also fixed the interest rate on a portion of our floating rate debt, given the historically low interest rate environment. This included entering into multiple swaps, locking in $1.5 billion in debt as far out as seven years. And lastly, from an FX perspective, the year-over-year FX impact for Q2 to revenue and EPS was a negative $8.9 million and $0.08, cents, respectively. Before concluding, I'd like to briefly touch on a couple of additional points. We entered the COVID-19 pandemic with a solid balance sheet and continue to maintain strong financial ratios with ample liquidity. This allows us to continue supporting our employees and customers and it puts us in a position to capitalize on opportunities as they become available. 
We continue to prioritize capital allocation and prudent expense control while remaining intensely focused on current trends to ensure we remain in a strong position. Al mentioned a few items on fiscal Q3 revenues and to repeat them, at this point we're looking at Cooper Vision being down 15 to 20 percent and Cooper Surgical down 30 to 35 percent, both in constant currency. Other than that, we're not providing much additional information at this time. We're going to continue closely monitoring expenses, but we want to be careful as controlling costs is important, but at the same time we're seeing many positive trends and don't want to restrict our ability to execute in any way. We're taking a long-term view as our product portfolios are extremely strong and we believe we're in an excellent competitive position to take share as the markets return to normal. Finally, I'd like to echo Al's comment about our employees by issuing my own heartfelt, heartfelt thank you to all of our operations, commercial, and support staff for doing an incredible job in the face of unprecedented circumstances. I couldn't be prouder of the efforts we saw in Q2 and, I can, and continue to see from everyone globally. With that, I'll hand it back to the operator for questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Barry Kish with Raymond James. You may proceed with your question. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess, Al, just to, to start out, um, coming back to uh, CBI, um, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, I guess, how are you thinking when you when you think about the various modalities? Um, where, where did you see the most pressure, you know, in in the month of of April, and you know, where do you expect to see that come out the other side? In other words, what do you, what do you think is going to be stronger, you know, post COVID versus versus pre in terms of your product mix? Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, well. When you look at uh, April, I mean, obviously, we took a hit kind of throughout the portfolio. You know, the numbers I gave show you that our daily silicone hydrogel portfolio stood up uh, better than certainly the rest of our portfolio, and, and my day in particular was, was still strong. Um, but uh, some of our legacy products, and especially if, if you wanted to parcel it out, you know, if you look at our legacy um, uh, FRPs, the hydrogel FRPs, the monthlies as an example, those took a, a pretty solid hit in the, the month of April. So those have been declining anyways, but um, took a bigger a bigger hit than most. I think as, as we look at where we are today and as we do our consumer research and we talk to optometrists and so forth and the market starts to recover, it, it seems very, very clear that the market is going to recover with a focus on daily silicone hydrogels. That's, that's going to be the focus area, and that's going to be because of the reasons that were in place beforehand, but it's also because of the focus on hygiene. You know, if you're looking at good hygiene, you're talking about a daily lens. Put it in, wear it, throw it out at the end of the day. So that's clearly what people are talking about. That clearly is the focus. Um, I think we're in a good position from that perspective because um, if we go into kind of a more of a recessionary environment, you know, we're the only ones who have a, a strong mass market daily silicone there with clarity and sphere torque and a multifocal. And if we have somebody who's looking for a more premium wearing experience, obviously we have my day, which is which is hugely successful. So I think that's that's what we're going to see as we come out in the coming months and, and quarters. Okay, perfect. And then I guess the second question is, and you alluded to this in your comments relative to manufacturing for my day and your ability now to uh, in, in particular, Toric and your ability to now start to supply uh, countries, regions that, that you had pulled back supply on uh, previously, as well as getting fit sets out there. What what were you able to do um, during this, this period that allowed you to, in, in essence, it sounds like, get ahead of your, uh, get ahead of your plan? Yeah, so, I mean, we had the obvious happen, right, which was, like, a pullback in demand in general because you you obviously had uh, stores and so forth shut down around the world. While that was happening, we were continuing production of the product, building up our own inventory. But importantly, during that quarter, we were able to continue to work putting lines together and getting lines up and running. And that was a key point. You'll remember I talked about at the prior quarters how we accelerated some of our efforts 
Um, and, and we took a step back in some areas on cost control efforts and so forth, but we brought those lines in faster. Thankfully, we did that because with those lines in our facility, we were able to continue working and putting them together. You know, we didn't have equipment in Europe, and we weren't relying on people from Europe or other places flying in to help us. Our, our manufacturing folks were able to do that work themselves. And then um, the other success that we had was not only did we hit our timelines, when we started up a couple of the lines, we have several lines. We have two of them that have recently started. When we started them up, the production on those lines was a decent amount ahead of where we expected. So I take my hat out to the manufacturing guys. It's an amazing job there of getting those lines up, started, running, and having them be quite a bit more successful earlier than we thought. So, I mean, we're still in a situation where we have other lines coming on, and, and we're certainly going to need those lines based on demand, and that includes updated demand metrics right now where we sit and the demand that we're seeing as retailers and people start opening stores back up. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Weinstein with William Blair. You may proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, Al, as we come back here and things uh, start to improve a bit, does that um, does it matter for you if it's kind of more new guys coming in the 15% versus the existing? I mean, is, is, is if you think about one versus the other, is there one that's more important for a particular driving silicon hydrogel fitting? Yeah, it's, it's the new. I mean, so if you look at the data as we went into COVID, um, we were winning more than our fair share of new fits. So the, the America's market, or the U.S. market here is probably the biggest of that, right, is that that's where we were winning share. We had the My Day with Clarity. As new patients were coming in and getting fit, they were being fit more and more in daily silicones, and we were winning our lion's share of that. So that new fit was, was – that hurt us. Um, you know, and if you look at new fit data, we kind of talk about 15% or kind of in that range of uh, revenues coming from new fit. That's, that's an important part of our business, and, and that's even larger here in the U.S. So I'd say the 15% is a global number. You know, if you look at the U.S., you could argue that that's 20% of our revenue here in the U.S. Um, you have a lot of new daily fits. You have people buying annual supplies and so forth. So um, that was one of the reasons, frankly, that our America's number was softer, I think, than probably people thought. We over over index in terms of new fits and the hit that we took because of that. Okay, great. And then as we think longer term here about the industry, how do you think the industry is changed longer term because of COVID? And how is Cooper positioned in the industry now? You know, as we think about things like online um, and uh, online ordering, you guys shipping direct, um, prescription moving online. How, how, how does all this kind of play into kind of how the industry develops and then how you think your position for all of this? Yeah, well, I definitely think you're seeing some changes, right? Direct-to-consumer shipments, as an example, definitely increased significantly. Um, whether that holds or not, we'll see. I, I, that was a trend that was occurring. We probably accelerated some of that trend. You remember I've talked for a couple of years here about how much time and money we put into our distribution centers to improve our distribution capabilities. I mean, thank God we did all that stuff because we're in a great spot to be able to support the market as, as we move in that direction. So if you're an optometrist selling products, you no longer have to have us ship that to your office. We can ship that directly to your patient's home. But the other thing, I think when you look at the industry right now, I think you're actually going to see even more uh, or a greater move to daily silicones. I think that's the direction you're going to go. As I was talking about hygiene, you know, when we talk to consumers, when we talk to optometrists, that's what people are leaning towards. The other thing that you're seeing about the industry is people looking and saying, okay, how can I do a better job as an optometrist's office moving forward here in terms of, of the products that I offer? And I think that's one of the reasons that we've had kind of the acceleration in demand in my site. You know, some of it's like docs don't want to miss out, but there's definitely a component where doctors are saying, hey, this is a unique special product here. Now that I understand it and it works and so forth, this is something I want to get behind. So I think you're going to see that. And then the one other area I would say that I think changes a little bit in the industry is I think around toric lenses because that's one of those things that, um, you know, the patient has to go see the doc, get fitted by the doc. You're not going to use uh, telemedicine to fit a patient in a, Toric lens. So I think you're going to continue to see um, Torics grow faster than the overall market. Great. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Johnson with Baird. 
you may proceed with your question. Thank you. Good evening, guys. Uh, Al, I wanted to start maybe from a geographic perspective. Uh, you mentioned kind of the over-reliance on new patient fits in the U.S. You know, obviously in Europe, you've got some just automatic drop ships that happen or patients who are more on a subscription plan there. So I think it would be helpful if you could provide any color on kind of how you saw the uh, April-May trends break down between U.S., Europe, or Asia-Pac, or at least maybe kind of how you're thinking about the recovery by geographic region. That would be uh, wonderful if you could help us out with that. Sure, yeah, absolutely, Jeff. Um, I kind of put Europe in the middle to some degree um, because we're starting to see things come back in Asia-Pac. You know, I mentioned that we actually saw growth in, in China in May. I mean, it's not going to surprise me if Asia-Pac is, grows in Q3. Matter of fact, I think there's a decent chance we'll get that. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, you know, when I look at, at how things are going, I think we could get some growth in Asia-Pac in Q3. EMEA still, still is in a situation similar to the Americas. Uh, stores are starting to reopen, you know, optometrist houses are reopening. You can see that in the news like I can. So we're making progress there, certainly. Um, America's lagging that, right? So I think we're still going to have a, a tough quarter in the Americas uh, for Q3 because we had we had struggles, certainly, at the beginning of May. Um, we're seeing positive signs. There's no question about that, no question about that. But I think when you look at the impact of May on the Americas, you're going to continue to see that be another kind of – similar quarter to where it was, um, Europe kind of being probably a little bit worse than where it was um, as it comes out a little bit slower. So I was kind of thinking in my head, you know, February, March, April versus May, June, July for us, um, you end up with a similar to maybe a little bit worse quarter. Uh, that assumes, by the way, that we don't get like a rebound in some of the stuff like channel inventory and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. And, and, and then, uh, you know, I, Hold on, I lost my train of thought for a second just as I was thinking what you were saying there. Uh, oh, in these office visits, you know, we're all doing our surveys and, and there's other ways of trying to track this. Uh, you know, as, as those offices start to open up, my guess is that helps on the new patient fits more than anything. On the consumption by current wearers, uh, you think we need to start watching for when do people go back into the office, when do they go to the gyms and restaurants and things like that. It, you know, I know it's on the margin, but some of these people that only wear contact lenses for social reasons, things like that, uh, you know, it almost feels like there could be a slower uh, recovery in the current wearers more so even than the uh, the new wearers uh, just because there is kind of that reliance on, you know, when are we all going to go back into the office every single day, things like that. Yeah, you're spot on on that because that's what a lot of those wearers are, right? I mean, a lot of those wearers are wearing lenses. They they're, they're, could be teenagers or in their 20s. They're going back to the office. They're playing sports, right? They have that kind of activity. I mean, Carter soccer is – my son's soccer is going to start up next week, right? So you're starting to see that stuff move in the right direction, right? I mean, we're making progress there. But um, until people are starting to go out to, to restaurants for dinners and people are starting to go back to work and you're seeing more of that activity, you're going to see a little bit of a slower trend there because we did see um, kind of two pieces of that. I think one is people wearing glasses because they were home a little bit more. And then the other one is, is I mentioned the softness on our, like, legacy hydrogel FRPs. And, and that's a kind of a portion of the market where people will stretch their lenses. And that's the kind of activity we're seeing. So I think you're right. I think the channel inventory works itself back um, over the coming quarters, you know. I think the new fit data, you're right, starts coming back, and, and we start seeing that better, certainly as the months come here with back to school and so forth. Assuming that we're going back to school, everything's moving in the right direction, maybe a little bit more of a lag on the other stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question comes from Larry Beagleton with Wells Fargo. You may proceed with your question. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Al, I, I guess uh, do you expect it you know, to still be down year over year in fiscal Q4? And I guess what what, what would need to happen to, to grow in fiscal Q4? You know, which of these – could there be some, you know, catch-up from, you know, deferred uh, sales and procedures from, uh, you know, from, from April, May? Um, you know, any any – color on that yeah I, I think um, you know for the two separate businesses maybe answer it a little differently uh, for Cooper vision I do think we can get back to a situation you know where we're flat for Q4 maybe we can even be up a little bit I think it'll depend some on the channel inventory coming back and it'll be highly dependent on stores reopening and then obviously for us not to have kind of a second rush rush of uh, 
of uh, COVID-19. But um, I do think we can move in that direction based on the progress that we're seeing in some markets like Asia-Pac already. If, 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 if we use that and we look at that as what's going to happen in Europe and then into the U.S. and that those positive trends continue, I think that puts us in a decent, decent spot. We're going to fight like hell certainly to uh, at least be flat in Q4. Um, if I look at Cooper Surgical, some of that's going to be dependent on Paragard. You know, I mean, Paragard continued to be fit, but because of liquidity concerns and so forth, we ended up not shipping product for a couple months. That will come back. I'm, I'm highly confident that we'll get that inventory and so forth back. So it'll depend, does that come back kind of at the end of Q3 or into Q4? The survey work we have done has showed, you know, cancellation rates going down and so forth. The surgeries that we're involved with, at least, all appear to be deferred rather than canceled. So if um, uh, GYN offices are reopening, then that's a really good sign. I think we'll be, we could return to positive growth in Q4 there. Fertility clinics are definitely open. We're definitely moving in the right direction there. Um, we do lag, as I mentioned, sales there. That's going to be a little bit of a hurt right now because the clinics reopen. Um, uh, people are going in or having consultations or getting their start in the stimulation process and so forth. So we lag a little bit behind there. But um, if that go, if that those trends continue, um, yeah, we we could be in a decent shape. So I would kind of say consolidated. Yeah, we're going to fight like hell to get back to at least be flat in Q4. And, and now, just as a follow up, can you talk about what you're seeing at optometrist offices? You know, the percent that you think have opened so far, and any you know any issues with throughput, how they're dealing with uh, patients coming in. Thanks for taking the questions. Sure. Yeah. It, you know, if we go around the world, there's a, a very large number of optometrist offices that are kind of quote unquote open. Um, but a lot of them have been open all along, right? They were just open for kind of emergency cases rather than uh, everyday patients. So we are, we are definitely seeing more and more of them open, but they're in different degrees of opening, right? Some of them are opening up with um, uh, a lot of restrictions, right? Patient has to sit out in the parking lot and they come in one by one, and they clean the entire area down before that patient comes in, so your your patient traffic is significantly slower. Um, we certainly see that, like, where we're at here in California. You know, you go to other spots in the U.S. and other spots around the world, there's not nearly as many restrictions. So um, we're in varying different, varying degrees kind of around the world, so it's kind of hard to answer. that. The one thing I would say that seems to be pretty clear is that offices are definitely opening, more patients, more patient flow is definitely occurring. So the trends are, are clearly positive, but we still have a little ways to go. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matthew Nishan with KeyBank. You may proceed with your question. Um, great. Thank you for taking the questions. Um, hey, Brian, I think this one's from Brian, actually. Um, the decremental gross margin um, in, in supervision for the quarter was, was much lighter than I think you'd expect given the sales decline. Uh, is there a potentially a delayed margin impact because you're selling inventory that was that was built with, with better manufacturing absorption? Yeah, good question, Matt. Um, so you're right. So I talked about it in my, my prepared remarks that CDI was impacted by regional mix, so we had a higher percentage of declines in revenues and markets where, where we had higher margins, like, like in the Americas, down 22%. Now, as it relates to, um, you know, capitalized costs, and I won't get into a whole cost accounting discussion on this call here, but um, suffice to say, you know, what we, what we really did is we adjusted um, the large sort of COVID-19 uh, related costs and other manufacturing costs, those period costs um, that uh, and we called those out. We adjusted earnings for those, so that 22.1 million, if you look at our gaps and non-gap results, reflects sort of those unabsorbed costs, um, you know, the excess capacity um, and those types of costs that that were above and beyond our normal operations uh, and incremental from prior to the pandemic. So you won't see those really bleed into future quarters. We're not capping and releasing those. Uh, down the road, and and that's why you saw uh, gross margins where they were. Okay, un, un, understood. Um, and then, as you think about the industry, um, typically you see rebating based upon you know annual supply. Do do you see any changes in in the um, the way um, consumers are going to purchase contact lenses moving forward? Are going to be purchasing the ninety day supply rather than the annual supply? And kind of how do you how do you kind of see the industry adjusting to that as far as promotions and rebating? 
Yeah, that's more of a U.S. question than probably outside of the world. But when we look at that activity, we definitely saw some of that in uh, in Q in um, Q2 and even the beginning of this quarter. And I, I can give you some examples. You know, if you're a patient who had a year's supply and you were ready to order another year's supply, but you had to go see your optometrist um, and you weren't able to get into your optometrist, uh, I, I've heard many cases where the optometrist said, hey, I'll extend your script, so to speak, three months, and you can go get a quarter's worth of supply, but you don't want to buy a year's supply until I have a chance to check your eyes out and make sure that you're buying the right script. So we've seen a lot of that activity where patients were like, hey, I kind of want to get this done. I'll just buy another year's supply. I'll take advantage of that rebate or discount, but they're not able to. So that's a three-month delay in that kind of activity. Um, you know, I think the question longer term on that, because we'll get that back, we'll get those patients back and back, um, ends up being, is there kind of a fundamental shift in the market because of that? I think I would tie that answer more to a recession. You know, if you, if you get a recessionary environment, you'll probably get people trending to more three-month purchases, that kind of stuff, if they watch their money a little bit closer. We're, we are not seeing that um, based on the research that we've done so far. We're not anticipating that. We're expecting the market to kind of move back to normal. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matthew O'Brien with Piper Sandler. You may proceed with your question. Uh, thanks for taking the questions. Um, Al, you've been touching on this a little bit, but I, I was just hoping you can reconcile the shortfall you saw in the quarter on the trade-up side, which I think you said was $40 million for the most of the shortfall was associated with, you know, the lack of the trade-up with the comment that, hey, you know, the, the daily sky highs, which are more expensive, are going to lead us out of it with such, you know, such a high unemployment rate in the U.S., such a high unemployment rate around the world. You know, what gives you that confidence? What are you hearing from from a patient specifically or consumer specifically that gives you confidence in that? And are you are you putting any kind of programs in place to kind of ease the burden so that the people can do that trading up? Yeah, yeah, and just to be clear on that um, that trade up because that is included within new fits. So the biggest component of that was clearly new fits. You know, when you shut down the doctor's office and you don't have the new patient able to come in and and get a script and buy lenses, that's the thing that hurts you the most. Now you also miss out on the trade up, which is you know somebody who's wearing a, a monthly or two week or a traditional old, older hydrogel trading up to the new one. But the big part of that $40 million I was talking about is, is new fit patients, thinking about new patients coming in. Um, with respect to us kind of coming out of this with daily silicones, you know, if we come out of this in a decent way and the economy is doing well and so forth, you know, I think, I think you're not going to see much of a change at all. If we come out of this with a weaker economy, in my mind, you're definitely going to see a greater focus on clarity, right? That's the product that's going to do better and accelerate more because that's where people are going to be focused. If you're more budget conscious or cost conscious, you're going to still want a daily silicone hydrogel lens. That's what your doctor is still going to want to prescribe for you. That's the that's the market leading product, right? That's the only real product there for a mass market daily silicone hydrogel product. So it'll depend what def- what direction we go. I will say, based on where we are today and based on the feedback we're getting from people, there's enough demand out there where we're going to be selling, you know, a very significant amount amount of my day, no matter what. Even if it's premium, even if we went into more of a recessionary kind of environment, um, the demand there didn't disappear. It remains very, very strong from our consumer research. Okay, that's that's interesting and helpful. Um, and then the second question was just on my site. Um, yep. You know, you're, you're backing off a little bit on the spend this year, totally understandable, and and the uh, the revenue contribution this year. But next year, you're still confident in that twenty five million. Are you going to ramp up? You know. Some of the uh, the spending dollars, you know, that we're saving this year, next year, or you know, what I'm also trying to kind of get is, was the 25 million conservative? There was upside, and maybe some of that upside is is now um, removed for the time being, and hopefully that gets pushed into the next fiscal year. Yeah, I, I kind of look at it, and I'd say that 25 million was probably a little conservative um, beforehand, but I would say that it's probably still a little conservative right now. Um, the difference that we're seeing is a greater interest by optometrists with respect to my site. Now, some of that was because people were home, right? They had the time to be able to to go through the training, to look at the information, the clinical data, and so forth, get comfortable with the fact that, wow, this product really works. This should be standard of care. How am I not going to treat my my myopic children in this in this lens? How can I not have a conversation with the parents about it? 
So the interest is definitely increased in that product, you know, and the number of people we're training inside the U.S. and outside the U.S. is definitely higher than than what we were anticipating it was going to be pre-COVID. Now, you can only fit it if you're – your office is open and, and kids are coming in and so forth, so you got to get back to normal. But um, I think that that uh, we might arguably be in better shape with my site, um, oddly enough. Now, we did defer some marketing expenses on that, but we're still going to spend a very hefty amount of money this year. And depending upon what we do in Q4, because we're, we are seeing that acceleration in in interest, and, and um, uh, that's not only U.S., that's around the world, we might spend a little bit more. So I'm not going to hold back on investing in my side. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Cooley with Stevens. You may proceed to your question. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking the questions. Um, let me just first follow up on, on Matt's question on my side. I would appreciate it if you could – Help us get a little bit better understanding of where uh, you're seeing the demand between U.S. and international, uh, a little bit better flavor there as well in terms of the training and your thoughts as they pertain to some of the new spectacle uh, alternatives that have been publishing data here recently with some pretty impressive results. So just wanted to get your view maybe if, if that's near term, obviously, how, how my side is ramping and maybe longer term. I know you just reiterated the $25 million next year, but – how you see the size of that opportunity. I had a quick follow-up on Paragard. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, the in the U.S., we're seeing the significant interest, certainly, in the training, the numbers and so forth that I mentioned. Now, that has to translate itself into fittings. Um, we were definitely seeing fittings, no question about that, earlier in the year. Um, and we have more and more kids who have been fit in the lens. And, and as stores reopen, I'm confident we'll, we'll see that number increase. It'll just be a question of how much it increases and how fast it increases. Outside of the U.S., um, we, we're doing some work with uh, some some fairly decent-sized organizations talking to them about this product, and and uh, we'll see how that plays out because that will that could move the needle. So I would say interest is high. Again, from a demand perspective, when you look at actual sales of the product, you know, obviously those have been a little bit muted because offices have been shut. But um, whether it's in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., the interest is, is certainly high. Um, I have not set back from kind of my position and my excitement about this entire industry. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, um, the ability to treat kids who are myopic and they're only going to get worse their myopia is going to get worse, and being able to minimize that progression of myopia is an amazing thing. And and to me, you know, it's you're a physician. How are you not evaluating that and treating your patients, right? So I think as as more people look at getting into this space, and you talk about people with spectacles, right? As spectacle companies continue to research, you know, I think it's fantastic. I'm excited about that data. I've seen that data. I know some of those companies. I've read their information. I'm ex- I'm excited about the opportunities and so forth with those with those guys. We're still early stage. There's no question about that in terms of the data that's out there and the potential to put product into the marketplace. We're well ahead of others with our with our uh, MySight product that's out there. But this is going to be a large market. It's just a matter of how long does it take to get there. Understood. And then if I could just quickly on, on Paragard for my follow-up, just I mean, it may be premature at this time, but help us think, are, are you seeing any shifts in, in the broader birth control market? I realize, again, when we think about uh, pharmacies remaining open, but any any bias to maybe shift, shifting to a more permanent uh, methodology of, of birth control or Again, a greater emphasis on uh, low estrogen uh, alternatives or no hormone or non-hormonal options. Thank you. Yeah, obviously, you know, with with Paragard, I'd love to say yes to that. We're probably a little too early to see um, whether that's happening or not. You know, when you look at what's happening in the world today with COVID-19, do people look at it and say, hey, I want a non-hormonal option. I want what I would describe as a healthier option. Um, We'll see how that plays out. I mean, I would say that, you know, new placements of Paragard were down pretty solid. In April, they were down about 65%. You know, in May, they were down only about 40%. June, we saw a nice rebound. Or, I'm sorry, June, we're currently seeing a nice rebound right now to start the quarter. And based on our survey work and so forth, I mean, we might only be down 20% year over year for June. So we're seeing a pretty impressive kind of uptick on that. Now, 
does that continue or does that accelerate? We'll see. I'm, I'm certainly happy with the numbers I'm seeing with Paragard. Um, I don't have that kind of visibility, obviously, within um, the hormonal IUD market, but uh, Paragard's certainly taking steps in the right direction, that's for sure. We'll just see how it plays out. I, I hope that's true, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joanne Woods with City Bank. You may proceed with your question. Uh, thank you very much for taking the question, and good afternoon. Um, a, a boring question and maybe something more interesting. On the boring side, what are you seeing as your FX headwind this year? Um, well, boy, you've seen rates move pretty aggressively here recently. I think the euro went over 113, so I'm, I'm going to look at Brian. I'm not sure there is a headwind. Yeah, I mean, from, from a revenue perspective, I mean, it's going to be uh, – I mean, revenues are still down for us for the year. When we haven't obviously given FX rates, so we're not giving guidance for, for the latter part of the year. But for Q2, I mean, it was, you know, $3.5 million worse on the revenue line and about $0.10 cents worse uh, on EPS for Q2. Okay, that's, that's a good start. Um, and then I want to go back to the comment of flat revenue in the fourth quarter. So for you guys, that would be August, September, and October. How do we think about um, getting to flat revenue? Um, what I'm trying to get at is a combination of what is the build to get there, and then also how does the, the optometrist and ophthalmologist office change in a social distancing six feet apart um, environment? Thank you. Yeah, great question, because in order to get there, in, in order to be as successful as we want to be in fiscal 21, we need optometrist offices reopen, reopen and, and operating to some decent degree. Um, we're not going to be in a situation where you're going to return to normal. You know, you're not snapping your fingers and seeing August volume being the same as it was last year because you are going to have social distancing and the other requirements that are going to continue out there. Um, but we need to continue to move in that direction, right? It's almost like you go to a cold pool, right? You put your, your toes in and then you put your foot in and, when it's not that bad, right, maybe you step in and then it's not that bad and ultimately you jump in. I mean, we're still in those early stages of kind of sticking your toe in the water in a lot of places. We need to continue to make that progress. For us to be flat in Q4 we um, and, and to do what we want to do going forward, we obviously need that to come back because we need new fits. Um, I think the volume is going to be there. Ultimately, I think as long as doors are opening, patients are going to go in there. The demand for contact lenses is going to be there. Um, we're not seeing anything in our research that indicates otherwise, so it's really going to be tied to optometrists opening up their, their stores. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Block with people. You may proceed with your question. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, good afternoon. First, we just on inventory in the channel that compressed in the quarter. I guess, Al, you know, where was it prior where is it now? And then I believe you said you expect it to remain, you know, call it at this new lower level for the foreseeable future. So if that's the case, is this the new normal, and why would it stay down here and not eventually sort of recapture where, where it was, and then I've just got to follow up? Um, yeah, with respect to inventory, uh, we, we saw it kind of around the world. It was probably more focused here in the U.S. because you have a bigger distributor market. Um, ha having said that, I do think – the majority of that are, is going to come back, or a large portion will come back. Now, not all of it, because you had inventory, for instance, in optometrist offices who ultimately, as part of their buying group or individually, are going to not want to carry that inventory anymore, which means we'll end up carrying it in our facility, and then we'll ship it direct to patients. So it will be a little different structure of how that works. So I don't think all that inventory comes back, but I do think we see that inventory coming back. It's just going to be directly tied to store openings. The more they open, the more they start um, selling lenses, fulfilling product, the more distributors and the larger retails, retailers will buy product back and be properly properly stocked. Okay. And just as a clarification, though, the fiscal 3Q numbers that you gave out on CVI, that does not assume much of a, of a rebuild on the inventory side. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, got it. And then just the, the second question, you know, in some of our checks we heard about, hey, as the optometry practices were closing and consumers were worried about securing lenses, some of those guys who used to get their lenses from an ECP just went ahead and said, you know, I'm going to turn to one agent contacts or another pure online provider. So, 
if that remains, you know, and that shift of lenses goes away from the ECP to appear online, can you just talk about, Al, what does that mean, if anything, for you guys from a margin perspective, if that remains in place? Thanks. Yeah, uh, you did see some of that activity, right? And for us, it kind of neutralized out because we saw some buying activity in March. It neutralized itself out in uh, April from a reporting perspective. And if you look at the shift to online, you definitely saw a greater shift to online and also direct-to-patient activity that we were just talking about. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes if it goes back, right? Some of that online activity is actually people buying through a Walmart.com or through, you know, Specsavers or Grand Vision or someone else's, you know, National Vision's websites. Um, uh, at the end of the day, does that shift stay where it's at? I don't know. I mean, to us, it doesn't make that big of a difference at the end of the day, how that how that sold through. I mean, it's not that big of a difference to our P&L. Okay, fair enough. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Anthony Patron with Jeffries. You may proceed with your question. <laughs> Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the questions here. Uh, maybe one on CVI, one on, on, on Paragard. I, I guess, Al and Brian, just as you look at the, you know, shape of the recovery and new fits, you know, some of your competitors, you know, maybe commented that it could take a, a little bit of time here and it's not necessarily V-shaped. But I guess maybe, you know, your, your counter to that, how do you see the recovery shaping out? And in particular, how do you see, see the school season playing a role here? Do you get a fair amount of those new fits back with the back-to-school season in September? And then on, on Paragard, just a clarification on on the channel hit. I mean, should we expect that a fair amount of that inventory in the channel flows as OBGYN offices open in the coming months? Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, quickly on Paragard, yes, that inventory will start to, to flow back in because, at the, frankly, at the end of the day, you had placements continuing this in, entire time, and they started accelerating back, as I was saying. We didn't ship anything um, tied to some liquidity concerns and so forth. That's all fine. Um, that will start making its way back into the channel. You know, my guess is you see it making its way back in in July, um, which would still be our fiscal Q3, certainly in Q4, so... Um, from a reporting perspective, it'll depend when that happens. We'll just be transparent with you guys and give that information as it as it comes back. Um, if I look at the new fits, um, again, that'll depend so largely on uh, optometrist offices reopening. I I have a, 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 a tendency to agree, I guess, with others who said, hey, that's not necessarily a V-shape because you, you have to have optometrist offices open and immediately have a lot of traffic coming back in there. So I do think it'll be a little bit slower of a comeback. Um, you know, it's going to happen. Stores are opening. Traffic is happening and so forth. So I guess it would just be a, a matter of how you define your V. But I would not assume you're going to see, like, a mad rush back in. That's one of the reasons I think that um, the Americas is going to have a softer fiscal Q3 for us. And that's one of the things that's going to kind of keep Cooper Vision's numbers a little bit softer in Q3 is, is that timing around the Americas coming back. I do think that unless something – kind of goes off the rails that uh, as we move back into school season, right, kids going back to school in August, September, and that kind of time frame, and then getting back to school and realizing they have a vision problem and then needing to go to the optometrist September, October, um, I think we're going to have a much more active uh, fiscal Q4 in terms of new fits. That's very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Crespo with Guggenheim. You may proceed with your question. Thanks. Uh, Al, I just wanted to piggyback on that that last point, and it, it seems like a lot of the discussion is around the demand, the, um, the supply side, rather, and optometry offices opening back up, but little assumed impact on the demand side from the macroeconomic fallout that we've experienced here. So uh, I, I'd love to just know how you're thinking about that and, and lens utilization given this higher unemployment environment, uh, maybe any lessons we could take from 2009 where market growth got cut in half, and it took a year or more for things to really rebound. Yeah, Chris, you're, you're, you're spot on there. I mean, um, when you go back to 2009 and when we've seen kind of uh, ec economic struggles out there. Uh, the contact lens industry, if I'm remembering right off the top of my head, was down uh, three percent, or was up three percent in 2009. I think we were up five. Yep. Um, 
So uh, we still put up pretty decent numbers because of all the under, other underlying factors that are out there, you know, the geographic expansion and so on and so forth that occurs. But um, if we are in a more of a recessionary environment, I would anticipate that that would reduce the overall growth of the market and, and our numbers also. Okay, but that's not what you guys are, are seeing or expecting at this point? Um, you know, it's a little tough. When you look at the, the numbers that I'm talking about right now, it's much more tied to store openings than it is anything else. I'm assuming um, that we get what kind of people are thinking, right, like a, a, a slow progress of improvement in terms of unemployment and so forth, because we're only talking really about the next, you know, five months, something like that right now. This, I think the question you're, you're talking about would hit us probably more in fiscal 21. Okay. Uh, and then can you just clarify what the Paragard revenue number was for the quarter overall? It's uh, it was twenty three million. Let me just see here. Twenty three million. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Lickman with Oppenheimer. You may proceed with your question. Thanks. Uh, Al, I just wanted to follow up on Chris's question on un, uh, unemployment. Uh, you mentioned if we see elevated unemployment clarity uh, would, could, would be a key focus within daily sci high. But I just want to put a finer point on, do you, if, do you see any risk to a slower shift to dailies overall for the market in an elevated unemployment environment? And, uh, you know, I don't know to the extent you can go back to the 8 through 10 context on that as well. Yeah, not really, because your price differential isn't that great. So optometrists are still looking at it saying, hey, what's the best product to fit my patient in? The best product is the daily lens. You know, when I look at it from a hygiene perspective or a comfort perspective or any kind of all the different angles that you would look at it, you know, you're saying a daily makes the most sense. Um, somebody who's cost conscious moves more towards a clarity daily, which gets a lot closer, by the way, to like a monthly lens because with a monthly lens, you also have to have solutions on. So keep in mind, it's not you have to compare any of your FRPs plus your solutions cost to the cost of your dailies. So that delta in cost is, is not that great, and, and you're not going to want to have optometry. Or you're not going to see optometrists wanting to push some of those products over a daily. Great, that's helpful. And then just um, on some of the investments you targeted this year and any impact from COVID. Uh, should we assume the same CapEx levels you previously talked about, you know, giving your comments during this call about my day and clarity manufacturing, or is that getting you know, cut at all? And, and what about DTC around Paragard? Thanks. Yeah, the DTC on Paragard, um, we deferred some of that. So we had some TV advertising and so forth that was occurring in Q2. We were able to defer that here. Some of that activity is actually going on now. Um, and then we're just continuing to evaluate that right now, whether it makes sense. You know, we kind of touched on that earlier. Is there a shift in the marketplace more towards a non-hormonal product? Like Paragard is such a great product, right? Does, does this help kind of push it in that direction? You know, I hope so. We'll see. Um, the sales team is – our sales team is just insanely good that's handling that product right now. So um, I listen to them. I kind of take direction from them on that. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out, and then we'll adjust accordingly. Um, on the kind of CapEx side or the capital side, you know, a lot of the costs that we have right now are already built in. That's why you saw a big CapEx number this year, this quarter, and you'll see one next quarter um, and even kind of finishing the year out because those, those lines are ordered, you know, 18 months in advance and so forth. I do think because of, uh, you know, the environment we're in and the progress that we've made, especially with my day, you're going to see kind of one of these classic Cooper things that if you go back in time and look at us over the years when we do these investment cycles and we get a situation where we start getting in a good position like we're in today and uh, where we've accelerated some of that success, we do run into a scenario at some point where our CapEx declines pretty decently and our cash flow shoots up pretty solidly. So I think that that event, which is going to happen, is probably going to happen a little bit sooner than we were thinking. Uh, it's just a matter of when that's going to happen. But um, I think cash flow continues to be tight because of CapEx for a little while, and then, then it, it'll increase materially. Got it. Thanks, Al. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve Willoughby with Cleveland Research. You may proceed with your question. 
Hi, good evening. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, first, maybe for Brian, you know, with the, uh, I guess, you talked a little bit about the, the call-out as it relates to gross margins earlier. You know, I guess I was a little bit surprised at how large of a call-out you're making here in the quarter. It's, you know, accounts for more than, you know, 10% of your COGS in the quarter. So it, it, maybe if you could help us understand, you know, what, I know you're not giving guidance, but, like, what margins could look like going forward, you know, given this sort of uh, call-out related to COVID here in the quarter, and, and then, you know, what sort of decrementals look like with the uh, revenue, expected revenue declines in the third quarter. And then I have one quick follow-up on inventory. Yeah, so just, um, you know, to elaborate, I mean, really in Q2, we proactively shut down lines either purposefully for demand reasons uh, or to address social distancing protocols. So we incurred higher, higher than usual costs uh, from these actions. So, you know, given that the production level, levels have fallen, um, you know, what you saw were those additional costs that we incurred, those period expenses that got flushed through the P&L, and we, we captured those larger costs, and, and, uh, and, and that's what you saw as the adjustment. Um, you know, obviously, with uh, regional mix and product mix, that, has, that moves the needle. When you see, you know, uh, regions um, dropping uh, 22% or, you know, 11% and so forth, um, it's going it, to – it'll move the numbers a little bit. But I, I would expect – that as the business continues to, to uh, recover and, and you get towards Q4, especially Q1, if, if things are, is, are back on track, you're going to start to see your gross margins uh, expand and get back to normal. Okay. Would, would we expect to see non-GAAP gross margins in the third and fourth quarter look similar to what we saw in the second quarter, or, you know, could, or would they be worse than that? I just don't know what you're planning on calling out, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, I think really what you had for us is the, is an impact from COVID towards the very end of March and April. Um, so, you know, now that we're, we're, we're solidly in this and we're recovering, you're still going to see some, some of those similar non-GAAP adjustments in Q3. Whether they show up in Q4, you know, I, I, I don't want to comment on that now without seeing sort of how things improve. Uh, but certainly I would expect you'll see something similar. And, again, back to Al's comment earlier about, um, you know, the, the how markets are going to return and, and Asia PAC um, possibly showing some growth and, and Europe sort of in the middle and, and America is still lagging a little bit. Um, you're going to still have some of that, um, some of that, uh, some of the similar regional mix issue that, that we had in, in Q2 in practice in Q3. Gotcha. And then just real quickly, Al, follow up and related to inventory. You know, I know over the years, both you and, and Bob uh, back in the day, you know, we would talk about inventory and, you know, working down of inventories. Where, what's your feel for right now, I guess, as it relates more particularly on the, the CBI side, you know, as where channel inventory stands as compared to maybe what trough uh, inventory levels have been in the past? Yeah, it, it's always a little hard to say. I mean, we, ha we have good visibility when it comes to, to some of the guys, right, like our distributors and so forth, and then we have less – Visibility when it comes to some of the retailers, especially the retailers who have a lot of stores out there that that might not be uh, uh, corporate owned, right? They could be franchise stores and so forth. And then mm -hmm. um, the optometrist office makes it even a little bit more challenging, right? So I was trying to piece that out when I was looking at the month of April, and that's I kind of got to that thirty-five million dollar number, right? It's, it's all those are a little bit squishy, but um, I, I kind of think that that was the number, right? Maybe it's not as massive. As, as it could have been, but um, I didn't see, like, a sure. huge change. And, and one of the things that's kind of interesting is we've seen is some of these retailers are already kind of building up and, and they're anticipating that things are going to be okay. So I shouldn't say build up, right, but they didn't go quite down as far as much as I thought they would have gone from an inventory perspective, and they seem to be kind of starting maybe to come back a little bit. So it's a hard one, Steve. You know, you know we've talked about that over the years. It's always a struggle. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. And as a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. Our next question comes from Robbie Marcus with J.P. Morgan. You may proceed with your question. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Al, I know over the years you've always talked about maybe a, a three to five time net income dollar benefit from the trade-up from a non-compliant two-week to a compliant daily 
Is there any risk that as we move forward in a tough economic time that you might see the reverse happen as people trade down? And how do we think about any potential for people spacing out purchasing or trading down, down the P&L? Yeah, we don't really see that. So it's, it's pretty rare that we see someone trade down. Once someone moves to a daily, um, it, it would be not even, I'd probably be stronger, like incredibly rare to see that person go back to like a two-week or a monthly lens. I think you're going to continue to see that. And maybe some of that shifting decreases a little bit. Um, we'll kind of see how that plays out, right, because that would be your more cost-conscious. We move into next year. And you're not seeing people want to switch. They're happy with their two-week or their monthly lens, and their doctor's saying, hey, this is a better product for you, this daily sci high, and you should think about the shift. And it's a little bit more expensive. Somebody's like, yeah, I'm happy where I'm at. I'll just go ahead and stick with what I have. Um, I would think, you know, that's possible, and it's definitely more likely in, in the more of a recessionary environment where people are more cost-conscious. So it, it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. And then uh, just a quick follow-up. On my site, you said the launch was going well. I just want to – maybe you could put that in perspective. I don't know if you could put numbers on it. Is that, you know, the you talked about some of the virtual training. Is that what you were referring to, or were the sales numbers tracking at or above the $2 million in the U.S. that you had laid out earlier in the year? Thanks. Yeah, so I, I was talking more about the training. So people getting certified, people being ready to, to sell the product. You know, we've – Probably done around $3 million through the first six months. I was still talking about 7 to $8 million for this year. Um, so looking for some improvement here as we exit the year and certainly some improvement in, in Q4 as, as offices are opening back up. That's, I'm basing that off the commentary that we've received from, from docs out there who have gone through this, who are now certified fitters and able to fit. Um, their commentary that they are going to be um, – uh, talking to parents about that and having discussions and so forth. So um, what I was really referring to was we're getting more trainings. We have more docs certified and more docs in the process of being certified than we would have had if, if we wouldn't have done it online. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you. And I'm not showing any further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to Al White, President and CEO, for any further remarks. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time today. We had a lot to go through, so um, I think we hit on the high points, and um, uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with everyone again in, in three months. So, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.